Um, so, hello and welcome. Uh, this webinar is called Fatigue Analysis from Nonlinear FEA. <clears throat> My name is Joe Spadola. Uh, I'm an applications engineer for HBM Encode uh, based on the West Coast. <clears throat> and uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, how design life can deal with very type, various types of nonlinearities uh, within a fatigue analysis. Uh, we'll first define what kind of nonlinearities I'm talking about, uh, and then we'll see how we can leverage design life uh, to tackle this problem. <clears throat> and we'll work through a few uh, live examples along the way uh, so that you can see how you go about doing this uh, in the actual software. So, <clears throat> excuse me, this is our agenda for the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Uh, that we have together. I'll be start by uh, giving a brief background on uh, ENCODE Design Life, uh, which I assume uh, most of this audience is uh, relatively familiar with, uh, or at least has a, has a working knowledge of. Then I will introduce uh, three different types of nonlinearities that uh, you might be faced with uh, when doing a fatigue analysis. Uh, specifically, <clears throat> today we'll be discussing <clears throat> how to deal uh, with material nonlinearity. Uh, so that is, how do we go about a fatigue analysis when our component exhibits uh, nonlinear inelastic behavior? Uh, how do we properly set up our FEA uh, and how do we configure design life uh, to do this? Uh, then we'll look at how to deal with a case of nonlinear geometric loading. Uh, so what do we do in situations where the stress state uh, varies with the loading direction? Uh, and finally, we'll have a look at contact nonlinearity. Uh, that is, uh, what if our part has uh, nonlinear bushings uh, or something else that causes a uh, nonlinear load deflection curve? Uh, and again, I will show uh, a few live demos along the way so that you can see the, uh, see the software in action. <clears throat> okay, so uh, I want to give a, a quick background uh, on the software itself. Uh, as I said I, uh, earlier, I assume that most of you out there are probably familiar with ENCODE, uh, but I want to just take a second to formally introduce it to you again. Uh, and uh, for those who haven't seen it before uh, for the first time. Uh, Design Life is one of three software products developed uh, by ENCODE, uh, and it serves as a virtual fatigue prediction tool. Uh, in short, it turns stress plots into life plots. Okay, and we'll, uh, again, we'll see that uh, in use in a, in a little bit here. Uh, ENCODE has two other products. One is called Glyphworks, uh, and Glyphworks uh, is an efficient suite of uh, digital signal processing tools uh, with an emphasis on fatigue. So it's really good at taking uh, strain gauge data uh, and predicting life uh, from that. Uh, our third product is called Automation, and Automation serves as a database uh, for storing and managing large amounts of test data. Uh, the unique feature about automation, however, is that uh, Glyphworks uh, lives underneath it, uh, and it can automatically process data as it's uploaded to the automation server. Uh, since our focus today will be design life, uh, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper into its capabilities. Uh, as I've said already, <clears throat> design life is a virtual fatigue prediction tool. Uh, it takes FEA models with solved stresses uh, and can solve entire model uh, for fatigue hotspots. Uh, it can take files from softwares like uh, ANSYS and Abacus and NASTRAN uh, and some other packages as well. Uh, it can do, well, it's, this is an extensive list, but it can do stress life, strain life, and vibration fatigue. Um, it uh, can support multi-gigabyte size files uh, very easily. Uh, and it has a, a, an easy-to-use drag-and-drop environment. Uh, it also has something called one-click reporting capabilities, which allows users to uh, efficiently uh, and automatically generate a report of customizable results. Um, okay, so <clears throat> let's, uh, let's shift focus uh, to today's topic. Uh, how do we deal with nonlinearities that you might run into while trying to perform a fatigue analysis? <clears throat> The, the first thing that might come to mind uh, when you think of the phrase nonlinear analysis probably uh, relates to material nonlinearity. So how do we perform a fatigue analysis when our stresses uh, are beyond yield, when we're seeing plasticity, uh, when the stress and strain uh, is no longer uh, related by Young's modulus? 
so today we'll talk about two different cases in this regard. First, uh, we'll consider where fatigue hotspots are only found around notches in our geometry. Uh, and then we'll consider a case where fatigue hotspots are found in flat sections of your model, or that is to say when, uh, when gross plasticity is present. Uh, okay, so looking at this picture here again, we're concerned with the, uh, the red portion there. What happens when our, uh, when our stress strain gets up into that red portion there? Um, secondly, we'll look at uh, geometric loading nonlinearity. So again, how do we address uh, from a fatigue perspective cases where our stress states vary dramatically uh, depending on the direction uh, that the load is being applied? And uh, we're going to use this example here of a strut where we have different load paths uh, depending on whether our, uh, our strut is in compression uh, or in tension. Uh, and finally, we'll look at a case of uh, contact nonlinearity. Non uh, for this example, we'll look at uh, some nonlinear bushings uh, that cause a nonlinear relationship between the applied load and the deflection. Uh, okay, so uh, in this case, uh, simply scaling a stress state due to a unit load won't work um, because we know that the load deflection curve is nonlinear. So we'll see how, how we can address that issue uh, in, a, in a little bit. Um, okay, so again, we're concerned here with fatigue life in these various situations. Um, so what kind of FEA setup is required? Uh, and then how do we, once we, once we have a uh, solved FEA solution, what kind of design life setup is required, and can we leverage any uh, unique features of design life to help uh, either simplify the FEA setup or just streamline the process in general? Uh, and you know, if so, how how do we do that, and how do we set that up? So that's what we're going to spend the next 30 minutes or so exploring. Uh, the, we'll, we'll see many ways in which design life can help us do uh, do exactly that. Uh, what we'll find is that some situations require a little more setup prior to design life. Um, but if we take a second and consider the end goal before we even start our FEA, we can make the entire process as streamlined and uh, smart as possible. So the point is that fatigue life uh, is very sensitive to input stresses. So we first need to get stresses that we can trust. Uh, and this can be done in a number of different ways. In some situations, um, we can do that with design life. Uh, in other situations, we'll need a little more work on the uh, on the FEA side, uh, but once we have useful and and stresses that we can trust, it's quite simple. From there, all we uh, all we have to do is check where those stresses lie on our fatigue life curve, and uh, from that we can get a resulting life uh, and a fatigue life that we can trust. Okay, so let's first take a look at material nonlinearity. Uh, it turns out that fatigue hotspots typically occur around notches in your part. So these three pictures here show exactly that. Uh, okay, and the reason this happens is because notches are natural stress risers uh, in your part, and as your part is loaded and unloaded over time, these stress risers consequently cause large changes in stress, and large changes in stress is uh, the primary driver of fatigue. Uh, so as you can see from this picture, the hotspots are concentrated around these notches uh, and thus occur over a, a relatively small portion of the model. You can see the, the red sections here are relatively small compared to the overall model. So as you're loading uh, cycles over time, uh, it's possible and probably likely that your stresses in these, in these very localized areas may exceed yield, uh, the yield stress of the material. Okay, so you'll be entering the nonlinear region of that stress strain curve. <clears throat> um, we call this local plasticity, again, because it's, it's localized. It's in a very small section. Um, and if we run into the situation in a fatigue analysis, um, you can actually get away with running a linear FEA uh, and let design life perform what's called elastic plastic correction. Uh, this is the default implementation uh, in design life is called Neuber. And it's really just as simple as selecting the option from your uh, strain life analysis engine. So how does Neuber's rule work? Um, what it does is effectively predict local stresses and strains, local, so we're talking the nonlinear part, uh, from 
nominal linear stresses and strains. So here's how it works. Uh, this blue dot here represents, for example, your calculated linear stress based on some applied static load. Uh, as you cycle that load in design life, uh, if you have a linear FEA, you're going to be literally scaling up and down uh, this linear elastic material response line, this blue line here. Uh, okay, so uh, let's assume this yellow dot then is a scaled static stress from our linear FEA analysis. Um, as I just said, you'll be somewhere up this, this uh, elastic material response line. Uh, okay, so what Neuber does is essentially solve uh, an equal energy equation. So it finds the area of the blue square here and then finds where on the elastic plastic material response curve you'd have to be in order to obtain the same amounts of area in this green square. Okay, and the areas of the squares are a measure of energy because uh, energy is just area under the stress strain curve. Okay, so that's the basic principle of Neuber's elastic plastic correction, uh, and it's very effective and appropriate to use uh, when we have, again, just localized plasticity. Um, so the obvious advantage of this is that we don't actually have to solve a nonlinear FEA analysis. We can keep the FEA simple and solve a linear FEA analysis and let design life handle this plasticity for us. And again, this is appropriate in, uh, in local, uh, very local sections when our stresses are around notches. Okay, and again, those two shaded areas are equal. Um, <clears throat> now, like I said, uh, this only works for highly localized plasticity. Uh, if we encounter a situation of gross plasticity, uh, where scaling up the stresses and strains will exceed, will exceed yield across a wide portion of the model, Neuber's rule is no longer valid. Uh, so in this case, we need to actually solve nonlinear FEA with a kinematic hardening model. Um, then all you have to do is bring that solved uh, stress and strain into design life. To do this, uh, all you simply have to do is change two options. First, you need to tell design life that you're bringing in both stresses and strains, uh, and then you have to turn off plasticity correction. Okay, uh, this tells design life that you have calculated the appropriate stresses and strains, so there's no need uh, to correct for plasticity. So let's do a quick demo. I'm going to switch to the software and load up a uh, this is a preloaded design life uh, flow that I have. Um, so what I have is a simple model of a shaft, uh, and I have a load case in here. Zoom out a little bit. I have a load case in here. I actually have two load cases, but I'm only going to be concerned with the first one right now. So if we look at the stresses from the first load case, this is a bending load. Okay, so I've applied a um, some sort of constraint on this end of the um, on this end of the shaft, and then I've applied a bending load uh, in the positive or negative Z direction uh, over here on this end. So you can see these are the stresses due to those loads. Okay, So this is straight from my FEA analysis, single static load, um, nothing, uh, nothing complicated yet. Okay, So that's my input to this fatigue analysis. Um, from there, I need to tell Design Life how that static load is changing. So that's called uh, the load mapping. So I'm going to go to the load mapping. And you can see here that what I'm doing is taking that load case, that bending low case, and I'm assigning what's called a max factor and a min factor. And a max factor is literally a scale on the input stress uh, as well as the min factor. So it's going to calculate the overall delta S for every single node by being the uh, whatever the stress is in this model over here times 15. And then the min factor is going to be this stress uh, scaled by minus 5. Okay? So the resulting delta S at every single node 
is going to define my my cycle. Okay. Then the other option, or the, what I what we just talked about recently, uh, because I'm scaling um, and I have a linear FEA case, I want to turn on elastic plastic correction. So you can see here that I have Norbert chosen, uh, and this is going to uh, perform that correction that we just looked at in the uh, presentation a moment ago for me. Okay, so now I'm just going to run this flow. <clears throat> okay, and so the result here, we can look at the uh, FEA or the, the fatigue life, and we can see what I have now. Instead of a stress plot, I have a life plot. See, you can see my, my legend over here is showing me life. Okay, so this is a contour plot of life. So we're looking, uh, it looks like the minimum life here occurs at this particular node, and the minimum life is about, uh, what, 34 and a half thousand? Okay, so that means that cycle that I defined, that plus 15 to minus five times the, uh, whatever the, the nominal input load was, that cycle there can uh, happen 34 and a half thousand times before a crack is predicted to initiate at this node right here. Okay, so now what I want to do is um, look at this particular node a little bit more. Okay, we were talking about uh, how Neuber corrects uh, the stress for me if, uh, if I go uh, nonlinear or if I yield. So I'm going to go to a, another flow. Okay, this one I have set up. Now this flow is set up to focus strictly on that on the, the most damaging node, that node that I just looked at, the one with the absolute worst case. Uh, so I'm going to run this, and this is analyzing just that single node, but what it's showing me is two interesting things. One, it's showing me the what, what's called the maximum nominal stress, okay? So this value here is the maximum value uh, of the cycle. So it's the nominal stress uh, or the nominal uh, the, the stress due to the load I applied in FEA multiplied by my max value, which was 15. So that's giving me a, a nominal stress of 536 megapascals. Okay, um, the yield stress of this material is 248 megapascals or thereabouts. So you can see we're well above yield. We're in fact well beyond uh, UTS at this point. So what Neuber is doing for me is correcting this to be this over here. This is my maximum, uh, what we call local stress. So this is a post Neuber stress. Right? And you can see it knocks it all the way down from 535 uh, down to 270. Okay, so it's putting me back on the linear elastic, uh, sorry, on the elastic plastic response. Okay, so I'm gonna jump back to the presentation now. So if you, uh, if you remember what I said earlier, just to finish up the, the previous example here, um, the only way we'll get trustworthy fatigue results uh, is if we feed the fatigue analysis trustworthy stresses. Um, so in this case here, we had uh, a local plasticity. Uh, we were able to get design life to correct for that material nonlinearity for us, uh, thus simplifying our FEA. We were able to use um, uh, linear FEA, okay? Um, we were letting design life correct for the material nonlinearity. Um, so now let's take a look at, uh, at geometric loading, uh, sorry, nonlinear geometric loading. Um, here again, we're looking at a case where the stress states vary with the loading direction. So in this particular case, we're concerned with two, two different load paths. Uh, one due to compression or jounce, uh, and the other due to tension or rebound. Okay, so let's first consider a static linear FEA load case where the stress does not depend on loading direction. So this is very similar to the previous example we just looked at. Um, 
So if this purple dot here uh, represents our load case, okay, we apply to load in FEA. Uh, as we scale our stresses up and down to define our loading cycle, we're constrained to the line that our load case makes with the origin, okay, indicated by this dotted red line. Um, everything here is fine if our stress state does not depend on loading direction. Okay, because you can see uh, it's assuming linearity on both positive and negative loads. Okay, this worked fine in the previous example, but in the case of uh, the strut here, that's not acceptable. Okay, so what do we have to do in this case? Well, we perform uh, what we call a static uh, bilinear FEA analysis, where we solve a load case that captures the stresses due to the jounce, so this green dot over here, uh, as well as a separate load case that captures the stresses due to the rebound condition. Uh, okay, so from there, it's appropriate to assume linearity in each direction. Once we've defined the stress state for the positive load and define the stress state for the negative load, we can assume linearity in each direction. Um, the idea is to capture those two stress states independently. So now we can see that as we scale our jounce case by our positive loads, we'll have appropriate stresses up and down this green line here. And as we scale our rebound case by the negative loads, we'll move up and down this purple line, thus capturing appropriate stresses for each loading direction. So the setup in FEA would look something like this. Um, we simply separate our two uh, conditions into separate load cases. Uh, here we can see the jounce on the left and the rebound on the right. Okay, and we'll have two independent, like I said, independent uh, stress states due to those load cases. Um, similarly, we will need to separate our loading history into our positive, or jounce loads, uh, and our negative, or our rebound loads. Uh, we can do this simply in ENCODE uh, with a tool called the Time Series Calculator, uh, which takes in the entire load history, and with a little logic, it'll output two independent channels, uh, one for jounce and one for rebound, as you can see here. Okay, so the concept is similar to what we did in FEA, uh, where we want to take um, the case that we have and separate it into the positive load and into the negative load. Okay, and from there, it's pretty simple. We just perform a uh, linear superposition analysis in design life where we scale the jounce loads, uh, sorry, the jounce stresses by the jounce load history and the rebound stresses by the rebound load history. Uh, so the result is a stress history uh, that accurately captures the stress state of the model over the entire loading history, regardless of which direction the load is going. Uh, so the setup and the analysis here is actually quite simple. Uh, we have two static linear FEA cases, uh, and we let Design Life figure out which load case to use based on the loading history to solve a seemingly complicated case of nonlinear geometric loading. Um, some assumptions in doing this, uh, first of all, we'll need identical FEA models, so that's, uh, we'll need identical mesh between the two. That's usually not a problem these days. Um, also, we want to ensure we have uh, quasi-static uh, structure response. <clears throat> um, we're not accounting for dynamic behavior. Uh, and again, like I said earlier, uh, once we have these two low cases, we have to assume that uh, it does respond linearly in each load direction. Okay, so we're capturing a stress state in the positive, capturing a stress state in the negative, and then linearly scaling uh, in each of those directions. Okay, so I'm going to get back into the software again uh, and do uh, this exact demo. So uh, here's a pre-built flow. Uh, that's going to look at exactly what we were just talking about. I'm going to bring my uh, FE model into my workspace, and I'm going to bring my uh, force history, or my loading history, into my model as well. I'm going to hit display so that we can look at both of these. So here's my uh, shock tower. Okay. If I look in the 
<clears throat> results, okay, this came straight from FEA. I have two cases. As you can see, I have one called jounce and one called rebound. So these are my separate stress states that we just talked about. So I can plot my jounce stresses uh, just like this. Uh, you can see I have quite a coarse mesh on here, uh, but that doesn't uh, doesn't matter. All I'm trying to do is get the get the point across here. So these are the stresses due to jounce. We can look also at the stresses due to uh, rebound, and we can see that they are entirely different stress states, okay? So that's the first step of the analysis. We need to make sure we have those two cases independent. Secondly, we need to take our loading history, which is defined by this time history right here, and we need to separate out uh, what are positive and what are negative, okay? And like I said uh, a few minutes ago, we can do that with something called the time series calculator. Okay, all this is going to do is we've built a little logic into this to say uh, if my load is greater than zero, split it into one channel. If it's less than zero, split it into a different channel. So I'm just going to run this analysis. <clears throat> and here we can see I have uh, the resulting uh, loads separated out. So I've got everything for my jounce case here and everything for my rebound case down here. Okay. If we look at what we do to uh, set up the uh, the load mapping or how we define uh, these uh, the cycles here in uh, in Design Life, I'm going to go to my load mapping. Okay, this is the same thing we looked at in a previous example. But now I can see I have my two load cases. Okay, my first load case is from Jounce, and I'm sending it the uh, the load history that I separated from the, uh, or that I separated out into the positive and negative. So this was my positive, okay, so jounce is being matched up with jounce, and my rebound is being matched up with my rebound FEA case. Okay, so it's actually quite simple. Then we just do a linear uh, superposition, and the resulting life here is going to uh, be accurate because I have separated out uh, those two cases. Okay. So I'm going to go back to the presentation now. <clears throat> okay, so now let's talk about uh, contact nonlinearity. Um, here we're looking specifically at a case when the load deflection curve uh, might look something uh, like this, due to, in this case, nonlinear bushings. Um, so simply scaling a single static load case won't work uh, because we know that the load deflection curve here is nonlinear. Um, so with a, with a loading history of significant length, solving a nonlinear FEA analysis uh, becomes extremely computationally uh, expensive uh, quite quickly. So we'd like to avoid that uh, if possible. So what can we do? Well, like I just said, we know that static linear is not valid uh, because, as you can see here, if we apply a load case uh, of some small load, if we scale that over the load history, we'll be scaling up and down this purple line here. Okay? You can see as we scale higher and higher, we are severely underestimating um, the stresses that would likely occur uh, because of that load. Okay? So this isn't valid. Okay, a second option might be, well, let's just go to the maximum load and apply that in FE. Well, this doesn't work either because here you can see this purple line uh, is, uh, is too extreme as we scale up and down from that load case. Okay, we're not following this, this proper load deflection curve here. Um, so we would uh, be too conservative in the previous example, and in this one here, um, we are uh, too extreme. So the uh, the happy middle ground here is to solve uh, uh, static multilinear cases, okay, where we separate these low cases across the entire load range. So here we have four uh, linear static FEA solutions across this entire load range, okay. In this case, four 
uh, is plenty to uh, accurately capture the uh, shape of this low deflection curve. <clears throat> so the idea then <clears throat> is as we step through our load history, which you can see over here on the left denoted by this red uh, squiggly line, <clears throat> we look on our um, uh, uh, so we step through each time here, we find out what our load is, we find the corresponding bounding cases from our FEA load cases, and then we linearly interpolate between the two of those to find a what we call a participation factor from each load case. Okay, so time one here, you can see we have some load P. Uh, if we trace that value over to our... Uh, to our load deflection curve, we know what loads we applied in FEA. And so we can find out from the lower bounding case and the upper bounding case what uh, participation or what factor of each need to be considered at that particular load. So it would look something like this. If, uh, let's say we have a load of, of 175. If we know that our uh, second load case here, load case two, uh, was solved with a load of 100, and our low case 3 was solved with a load of 200, we simply linearly interpolate between the two to find out what participation factor of low case 3 we need to apply and what participation factor of low case 2 we need to apply. Okay, This case is pretty simple. It's simply going to be um, primarily uh, load case 3, so 75% of load case 3 and 25% of load case 2, okay? So the concept uh, is similar going forward. Uh, at each step in time, we will need to find these participation factors. <clears throat> so uh, for time 2, we'll see that load case 1 is the lower bound and load case uh, 2 uh, is the upper bound. Same with load case three. Here we have the upper bound and lower bound. Okay, so you get the point. So you step through the entire time history and uh, find the participation factors. <clears throat> now, uh, just like material nonlinearity case uh, that we talked about earlier, sometimes this, this piecewise linearization uh, just won't cut it. Okay, so for cases like uh, bearings or door slams or, or high G impact loads, we have no choice but to resort to a fully uh, nonlinear FEA analysis uh, where we apply the full load or loading history in FEA in order to get fully solved stresses and strains. Uh, from there, we simply bring those fully solved stresses and strains into design life and perform what's called a uh, time step uh, analysis. Uh, where design life simply puts the stress states in the order in which they occurred, and it tracks the stress uh, changes between those fully solved states. Uh, okay, so again, this will require more FEA setup uh, and a little more time uh, uh, in front of or, or prior to your design life analysis, uh, but for complicated cases like this, it's really important to capture the accurate stresses in order to calculate uh, these accurate uh, fatigue characteristics. Okay, so in summary, uh, this table here outlines the uh, types of nonlinearities that we discussed today uh, and what type of FEA solution is likely required in order to perform uh, an accurate fatigue analysis. Um, the point of all this is to highlight the importance of capturing accurate stresses if you plan on doing a fatigue analysis with them. Again, the name of the game is accurate stresses. Uh, so you, you're always welcome to go for broke with your FEA and solve a nonlinear solution, even relatively simple cases. This will guarantee that your stress and strains uh, are always correct. However, this case is, uh, or that is often extremely time consuming uh, and computationally expensive. So in some cases, uh, many of which I've highlighted for you here today, 
it's perfectly appropriate to leverage Design Life uh, to simplify the required FEA uh, and let Design Life take care of that nonlinearity for you, uh, or at the very least, uh, be smart about your uh, FEA analysis and work together with Design Life to achieve a, uh, an accurate um, but still uh, quick and computationally efficient uh, solution. Um, so again, just to review, we looked at uh, plasticity at notches. So this was a material nonlinearity. And what we were able to do uh, from uh, with FEA was a simple linear static analysis where we let design life take care of the elastic plastic correction in those local areas for us. Okay. Um, in the case of gross plasticity, where we have yielding across a large portion of the model or a large surface area of the model, um, there's, okay, Neuber breaks down at that point, it's, it's no longer valid, so we actually need to run nonlinear FEA analysis for the kinematic hardening model um, in order to capture our appropriate stresses. Uh, in the case of geometric loading, um, we were able to uh, solve two static cases in FEA. Okay, one that represented the positive loading and one representing the negative loading. Okay, so we call that static bilinear. Uh, from there, we just bring it into FEA, uh, or sorry, into Design Life and do uh, a linear superposition. Uh, and finally, we looked at uh, contact nonlinearity. Uh, and here, what we did was solve a uh, range of stress states. Uh, across the load range uh, to accurately capture the stresses uh, across that nonlinear load deflection curve. Okay, and then we found participation factors from each case and uh, were able to uh, <clears throat> accurately model the stresses um, in, in that way. So again, we had, uh, we called this static multilinear, where we broke up that curve into multiple parts, okay? um, however, many however many is necessary to, uh, to achieve a, a good approximation of that, uh, of that load deflection curve. Okay, so, uh, so that's all I have. Uh, I thank you very much.